Greetings from Mesa View United Methodist Church of Albuquerque, New Mexico. We hope this message will be meaningful and relevant to your life and your relationship with God. We invite you to join us for worship on Sunday mornings. Our traditional service is at 8.30 a.m. and at 11 a.m. we gather for contemporary worship. More information may be found at our website, mesaviewumc.com. Now may you be blessed through the reading and hearing of God's holy word. Our gospel reading this morning is Matthew chapter 13, verse 24 through 30. <laughs> he put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed the good seed in his field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slave said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, Collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned. But gather the wheat into my barn. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Before being appointed here to Mesa View, we serve two rural congregations outside of Clovis, New Mexico, in the eastern part of the state. And our first worship service was in House, New Mexico which was 30 miles or 30 minutes from Melrose, where we lived. That worship service was at 9 a.m. And as soon as it was over, I quickly got in my car and drove the 30 minutes back to Melrose for 11 o'clock worship. And that 30 minutes was much faster than the speed limit on the county roads, <laughs> not only so I could get there in time, but also because you could go faster because there was nothing between Melrose and House other than farms and ranches. One day as I was driving out to house, I saw this man standing out in the field, not doing anything, just standing there. I thought that's a little strange, but kept going on. And I was coming back to go into Melrose, he's still standing in his field. I thought that's really odd, but what do I know about farming? Maybe there's some purpose, he's contemplating something, you know, he's saying a prayer out there, I don't know what he's doing. So, you know, didn't really think anything the next Sunday, driving back out to house again, and he's still there. <laughs> so now my, my curiosity gets the best of me, and I have to stop. And, you know, he greets me as I get out of the car, and he said, you know, I've seen you here now two weeks. You've got to tell me, what are you doing? And he says, I'm trying to win the Nobel Prize. <laughs> I said, what? He said, I'm trying to win the Nobel Prize. It's a really prestigious honor, and I'm told that if you win it, you get more than a million dollars in prize money. He said, well, yeah, that's true, but I don't understand how this has anything to do with the Nobel Prize. And he says, well, I'm told that to win the Nobel Prize, you have to be outstanding in your field. <laughs> and since I'm the only one standing in my field, I figure I got a good chance. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> so last week we began a new sermon series, looking at what we can learn about growing our faith by lessons we can learn from the farm, an idea I stole from Reverend Adam Hamilton. And today we continue with another agricultural parable we find from Jesus. There are only two times in Scripture that we have Jesus talking about weeds. In that passage we just heard, and in the passage we heard last week, known as the parable of the sower. And in that passage, Jesus says, a sower goes out to sow seeds, and some fall on hard-packed earth, and the birds eat up those seeds. Some seeds fall onto shallow soil, and they grow a little bit, but as soon as the sun comes up, they wither and die. Some grow into rocky area, and the weeds grow up and choke those seeds. And then other seeds fall into good soil, and those seeds grow up and produce a bountiful harvest. Now the analogy Jesus is making there is about us as the soil and the seeds as the word of God, and how we are to prepare ourselves to receive that. And I said, all of us are really all four different types of soil 
at different times in our lives. It depends on what's going on and how receptive we are to receiving God's word. Hopefully, we're more like the good soil than the bad soil, but we have a little combination of both, at least if you're anything like me. Then today, we get this other story. Last week, it was there was uh, four different types of soil, but only one type of seed. Today, we get there's only one type of soil, but there are two types of seed. And when there's multiple types of soil, we have to prepare ourselves. And so that first step of discipleship was to learn to accept where we are to surrender and follow Christ. Prepare ourselves. But today, when we have these two different types of seed that can be sown in our lives... What we're told is that we don't know what type of seed it is that's going up until the harvest comes in. If you've grown a, a garden, you know that's the case. That when the first things just start budding up, you can't really tell if it's a plant, the seed you planted or if it's a weed, something you don't want in your garden. And while from Jesus' telling of this story... There, he doesn't give us any botanical descriptions of what this weed is like. Some have said that this weed is the bearded darnel, which grows throughout the world, but found particularly in the Middle East, which is why some people speculate that this is what Jesus is talking about. And the bearded darnel looks a lot like wheat until the time of harvest. So this is sort of um, the wheat on the, your left-hand side and the, the bearded darnel, the tear, on the right hand side. You can see they're fairly similar to each other when they're still in their um, green phase. And so Jesus says you can't pull that out because you'll destroy other things. Because one of the problems with wheat, one of the things about community as well, is that wheat is planted in tight groups. And so if you pull out one weed, you're liable to damage the other crop around it. And in particular, the bearded darnel wraps its own roots around the roots of the other wheat plants. So if you try to pull it out, you are going to rip out the good wheat along with it. But we are really both, like we're the, the multiple types of soils, we are both type of the wheat and the tear in our lives as well. And you think, no, no, that's not me. I just say the disciples are more like that. Because the disciples are the ones who don't get it. I mean, we might want to say, well, obviously Judas is the, the tear in that story. That's an easy one to, to go. But then there's the disciples not getting it. There's Peter denying um, Jesus on the last night. They have both of those entities in and of themselves. And again, quoting from Paul, Paul says that the things that he wants to do, he doesn't do. And the very things he doesn't want to do is what he does. We might say we do not grow the things we want to grow, but the things we don't want to grow is what seems to come up in our lives. But the biggest problem with tares, with weeds, when we find ourselves in those negative situations is that the wheat, the weeds fight the wheat for the nutrients in the soil. They fight it for sunlight. They fight it for all the things, the water, all the things that are necessary in order to survive. And the worst thing about the bearded darnel is not just that it's fighting the wheat and can cause it to die, but it actually has a fungus on it that's poisonous. And the toxins, when released, can produce drunk-like symptoms, hallucination, and even sometimes death. It's more common among livestock who eat it, but there are recorded deaths of humans who have eat, eaten bearded darnel. So what brings in these bad weeds? And what is, the, what is allowing these weeds to be scattered into our lives? What weeds are choking out God's sunlight? What weeds are keeping us from being as good of a harvest as we could possibly be? In today's parable, the bad seeds get sown when everyone is sleeping. 
And in Matthew and most of the Gospels, sleeping is usually a metaphor for spiritual sloth. What is one of the things that Jesus constantly says to the disciples? Stay awake. And what happens? They fall asleep. He says, no, stay awake. When are we sleeping? When are we being neglectful of our spiritual lives? When are we allowing these bad seeds to be sown? Now, some will argue that it's the devil who does these things. You could pick that up because the passage says you know, the enemy comes in and spreads these seeds. But I'm of the belief that I'm quite capable of doing bad things all by myself. I don't need somebody else to encourage me. I'm, I'm quite capable all by myself. And here's the absolute truth. Whether, no matter how you understand the term Satan, if we place the blame elsewhere, say it's somebody else's fault, Satan, they made me do it, then number one, we never take responsibility for any of our actions, which I think is the opposite of what we are called to do. But even worse is that we never learn from our mistakes. We never le learn what led us down that path. And we say, oh, it was somebody else. We never take any personal responsibility. And that means we'll never figure out what, are, what the weeds are in our lives. What are those things that are growing up that are choking out our faith? What are those weeds that distance us from God? What are the weeds that are destroying our crops and stopping us from bringing in that harvest? Sometimes we might not even know because, in fact, our, sometimes our fields are so full of weeds we don't even know it's until it's too late. They look the same sometimes. Sometimes that's because we're distracted and not paying attention. Sometimes we're sowing those seeds, not maybe, maybe not intentionally in our lives, but they're there. And sometimes it's because weeds are really in the eye of the beholder. I like to joke with my wife. She doesn't find this very funny, but the state flower of Texas is the blue bonnet, which is a weed. She doesn't think it's funny that the state flower of Texas is a weed because she loves blue bonnets. But it's in the eye of the beholder, right? If you're growing a strawberry patch, then grass is a weed. But if you're growing a nice green lawn, then a strawberry growing up there is a weed. What's the difference between those two things? It's our intentionality. What are we trying to do? Because if we just scatter seed and hope for the best, we'll get a little bit of what we hope to get, but we'll get a lot of weeds. A lot of other things that we don't want taking place. We have to be intentional about sowing and cultivating and watering and, yes, even weeding our spiritual lives in order to produce that harvest that God has called for us. Now, one of the prescriptions that has been called for by the Healthy Church Initiative that was passed by the Charge Conference last Sunday is to set up an intentional path of faith development. Not just for individuals in the church, but for the church entirely. What are we moving towards? What does a disciple look like? What does a disciple do? And how do we get people onto that path? Whether they're brand new to the faith or whether they've been here for 500 years. What does that look like? How are we going to be intentional about that practice and that process? What is that pathway to discipleship that would allow us to stop from falling asleep and allowing the weeds to grow up amongst us. But as we as a congregation begin to answer those questions and begin to make that path, do we have to sit back and wait and say, oh no, there's some team that's going to tell me, and let me, you know, gear, I'll come back. Do we have to wait that long to figure out what our own spiritual intentionality is? No. And just like last week, we went back to John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, and to say his covenantal prayer, the first step of discipleship, of accepting, surrendering, and turning our lives over to Christ. We go back again today to John Wesley and his general rules, which have been condensed down and called the three simple rules now. Does anybody remember what the first simple rule is? Love God. Nope, that's the third. 
Do no harm. Yes, do no harm is the first simple rule. To do no harm, it means that we have to take a step back and to evaluate everything that we do. Last week we talked about the first steps of the 12-step <laughs> programs of accepting that you can't do it yourself, realizing there's God, turning yourself over to God. That fourth step in them is a, a, a moral inventory of your life. It's the same thing here. Take a step back and evaluate everything that you're doing in your, in your life. Everything you think, everything you say, everything you do, seeking to see how it is that we might do no harm. To see everybody as a child of God. Not to judge the difference between the wheat and the tares, which is one of the things that Jesus is saying to us. To let God do that sorting. So the first step is to do no harm. The second step is to do good. This is when we step forward and we engage with the world. When we feed the hungry and clothe the naked and bring hope to the hopeless. When we walk with each and every one of us as children of God through this journey of life. And this is the key one, not that the others aren't also important. Because if you're doing, spending all your time doing the right thing, it's a lot harder than to find any time to do the wrong thing. To let those weeds grow up. If you're tending to your, your fields and you're not sleeping, then your crop becomes safer. And the third rule, then, is in Wesley's language, to attend upon all the ordinances of God. And that doesn't really mean much to us in the 21st century, so Bishop Job changed that to mean stay in love with God. And for Wesley, there were six things to help us to do that. There's multiple ways we do it, but he had six. And here's the good news for us, is that most of us are doing most of these things today. Because the first one is to attend public worship. You're here. Check. Congratulations. You got one done. <laughs> the second is the ministry of the word, either read or expounded. We do both. You heard scripture read. You're listening to me expound on what I think Jesus is saying in that passage. The next after that is for... Um, Participating in communion, although we only do that once a month. Wesley encouraged us to do it as often as we possibly can, following his example, which is three to five times a week. To engage in family and private prayer. Also to search the scriptures, which you might go home today and say, Was Pastor John right about that? You've got to look it up. Searching the scriptures for what God has to say to us. And finally, was fasting or abstinence, which with the NFL just beginning, you might be having to fast or abstain from watching the NFL by being here. So you can maybe check that off your list as well. But we have to make sure that we do these more than just on Sunday morning. Because if we're only tending to our, our plot of land one day a week or one hour of one day a week, we're going to get lots and lots of spiritual weeds. There's an old saying that you are what you eat. And you are what you watch, and you are what you read, and you are what you say, and you are what you do. And we are called to be ever diligent and attentive to the soil of our hearts, to prepare it to receive God's word, not to fall asleep on our faith so that the wrong seeds don't get scattered in there amongst the good seeds. And that begins here. It begins by attending worship. It begins by reading the Bible every day. It begins by praying every day. It begins by engaging in missionary activities or outreach, helping those who are in need. It begins by us beginning in small groups and other faith development classes to help strengthen who we are, to learn new things, and to share our own faith with others. It begins by partaking in communion. Jesus says you shall not live by bread alone, but by the very word of God. And that whoever drinks from the cup and eats of the bread shall never be hungry and shall never be thirsty. The Christian life begins as we had last week of accepting and surrendering and then following Christ. 
And we continue that path by being ever diligent in our faith life. Of making an every day, every moment thing. So that we don't practice spiritual sloth. Falling asleep in our faith and allowing the wrong seeds to get planted into our life. The seeds which can grow up and choke out our faith. And we do that by first doing no harm, second by doing good, and third by staying in love with God. And when we do those things, then we keep our soil fresh and prepared, we keep it watered, we keep it weeded, we give it all the right nutrients that it needs, and we keep a lot from allowing those bad seeds to grow up in our lives. And when we do that, we begin to produce that harvest that God has called for us. I pray that it will be so, my brothers and sisters. Thank you.